make a huge difference. So. As you said in your comments, it is a book for men and women. Things that are so straightforward. I'm really excited. Well, listen, I had a chance to not read the complete book, but. Well, this is, yeah, it is an incredible honor, but we are really honored that you're here at Howard. Party. Party a long time. A year long party, I'm too. Right? And Facebook will know about it. There are jobs and then there are candidates, and we just have to find a way to get the right candidates and the right jobs. I think students like comments, questions. <laughs> we love to be talking about Facebook, we talk about women. Um, I have a question. Um, I'm currently a 3L at the law school, and my question for you would be seeing that you had somewhat of a unique path to where you are right now, what advice would you give? Um, someone that's aspiring to not necessarily take that path to just practice law, but, you know, to do something innovative, creative, but still within that path. I mean, Facebook is a company that kind of embodies that, you know, and values, you know, creativity and individuality. Um, but for me, as I'm looking out into my career future, I'm kind of wondering, well, where do I go? What, what do I do? What kind of advice would you give in terms of, you know, creating that ideal or finding that ideal job? So I wrote a chapter on this in my book, and I think these are books we must have brought. So I'll give you one. Um, but I wrote a chapter on this where I talked about thinking about a career as a jungle gym, not a lab. And that's really important, particularly if you're studying law and you're not sure you want to practice law, right? That the obvious place to go is a law firm or an in-house counsel. Um, but if you want a different path, and I really encourage that. The days of joining one company and retiring with a gold watch are long gone. There's just a lot more mobility in our workforce. Um, the advice I give people is to really look for opportunities and a little bit counterintuitively, don't worry about the level you're in. It's interesting, both of the jobs I took and I write about this in the book, both at Google and at Facebook, are actually lower in level than any other opportunity I have. When I was a treasury, when I came out of treasury, I had you know, bigger jobs with bigger titles at federal companies, and at Google, I went in to be a director of a business unit that didn't exist. And people said, you're going down. And I said, well, I don't have any skills. I've never been in technology. I want to get my foot in the door. And then when I went and left Google and went to Facebook, you know, I went in as number two, and anywhere else I went, I would have been, I would have been the CEO. But for me, I wanted to work on something that was growing. So my answer is, have a long view. Don't worry about, you know, because if you are coming out of law school and you want a business side job, you don't always get the credit for the three years you spend. You sometimes have to take something that maybe someone would take out of undergrad. But if you have a history, if you think long term, you know, if you're going to work in the workforce for the next 40 years, does it really matter? Get your foot in the door on something that's growing. We have really complex problems to solve. And the more people with different perspectives can we bring together to apply their minds to those problems is the better solution. We are just looking for the best um, I'm um, I want to know, why do you think women don't sit at the table? So, stereotypes are enormously dangerous things. This Hi, is Dean Dark. How are you doing? Dean of our law school. It's an honor to be here. <laughs> Stereotypes, uh, there's something sociologists call stereotype threat. Stereotype threat means that the more you are aware of a stereotype, the more you will act in its accordance. So when we tell girls they're not good at math and science, if you remind girls right before they take a math test to check off, all they do is check off the test. You know, they will be worse on that test. If you tell girls on the way in, girls do really well on this math test, they do better. 
And so systematically, because more people have been more successful and leaders are men, it also is true of race. We are systematically biased against people who don't look the way we expect people to look, which is essentially what they And so when men and women perform at the same level, everyone, including those people, we remember the male's performance slightly higher and the woman's performance slightly lower. And so when it comes time to sit at the table, men think they've done better than women and more men sit at the table. We also, you know, we're systematically biased from early ages, so mothers, not just fathers, mothers, we overestimate our sons crawling and underestimate our daughters crawling. If you go into the schools, we systematically call on more boys and girls. So since very young ages, these women have been systematically underestimated compared to men. So when it comes to having to sit, pick your seat at the table where you feel you belong, it's not every woman, but on average, the data is super clear. And so that's what's happening. And what Lean In is trying to do, both my book and the foundation, is make us aware of these biases because we cannot fix what we don't admit. People are afraid. People are afraid to talk about gender. People are afraid to talk about race. People think if you mention any of these things, you're going to get in all kinds of trouble. Well, not talking about them is getting us to where we are now, which is not good enough. And so the message of Lean In is that we need to talk about this. Let's talk about the fact that, you know, there are 500 Fortune 500 CEOs. 22 are women. Five are African-American men. One is an African-American woman. Out of 500. That's not good enough. But unless we are willing to talk about the biases all of those people face, we will not change them. And so the sit at the table is part of surfacing that bias. Well, we understand that having a diverse perspective increases your value, particularly when you look at the fact that Facebook has 1.2 billion users now. We expect that that will grow, and those people don't all look. This is my other advice, right, which is to sit at the table, both mm -hmm. metaphorically and reality. Literally sitting at the table. Everywhere I go, every meeting I walk into, every business meeting I've ever been to, at the same level, more men than women sit literally at the table and more women sit on the side. More men than women sit. And so this is about finding a voice. I think about how often you're sitting at a meeting, let's say, and the woman says X. And then it's repeated by a man, it's like she never said it. That's that right, never tell all of us that happened. Right, right. And it's like he's the reference point and you said nothing. Um, and that is a perfect example of that stereotypic. <laughs> and it happens for two reasons. One is that we all remember the man. But the other one, and I, you know, the research is clear on this, is that we're going to apologize before they say it. Mm -hmm. The man, it, it's both systematic bias. Even if the man and the woman say it exactly the same way, we won't remember the man. But what also happens is a lot of times the man says, well, I believe X. And the woman says, well, I'm not sure, but there it is. And so they're not saying it with that same authority in their voice and confidence. And confidence, confidence is enormously a self-fulfilling prophecy. Leadership is a self-fulfilling prophecy. One of the reasons I wrote Lean In is my daughter, she was four. I played a song for President's Day of all the American presidents, and she looked up and said, Mommy, why are they all boys? Just what you're saying is so important, you know, to be the best in yeah. what you do and to believe that you are the best. Yeah. Not only to be, but to believe. Yeah. And that's important. That's what Howard does. It makes you believe mm -hmm. that you can. As you know, there's been a long road to get establishment companies or corporations understanding that Howard, schools like Howard, HBCUs can produce quality. Now that we've won that, it's your job to be that quality that we want to see. Mm -hmm. You understand? Mm -hmm. um, so we need you to be your best mm -hmm. so that we can then build those partnerships. Because it's still, it's hard to work at Facebook, right? We still want the best. I have a friend in Germany. Her son, five years old, said to her, well, I can't be chancellor, I'm not a girl. Because Angela Merkel is the only leader he's ever known. Now, he'll grow up and he'll realize he's perfectly, has a great opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, my name is Dominique Perkins, and my question for you would be, can you talk about the importance of mentoring for women? Because I think one of the things I've noticed um, in terms of leadership at Howard is that men are really great about bringing someone else to the table. And I think women, I think we have that ability, but I don't know that we practice it. So, I hope write a whole chapter on that too. Y'all are hitting all the main points. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I know I think they're the main points. I wrote a whole chapter. <laughs> Mentoring is a huge issue. We like people that look like us. That means that if mostly white men are in power, they are mentoring mostly white, white men and so, and so on. Um, one of the most important things the Lean In community is pushing, our foundation, my lovely board member, DC based, is sitting right here next to me and she's working on this, is, is what we call Lean In Circles. 
So the data is really strong that peer mentoring is actually just as good as mentoring above you. When I think about my life, my mentors told me not to go to Google and Facebook. But it was my peers who were like, those are good jobs, go there. And everything from microcredit to health groups to book clubs to weight loss groups shows us how powerful peer mentors can be. Uh, I'm announcing today on the stage here the launch of our Lean In Campus program. We are hoping to find great people like you all, men included, we always invite men, uh, to jump in and help be Lean In Campus leaders and form mentorship circles of men and women. You know, 10 people who agree to meet once a month to support each other. We also work hard with companies and all of our partners to explain to them that we need to mentor women. One of the things, again, my, my thing is I want to surface the things no one's willing to talk about. Here's what no one's willing to talk about. A man and a man alone in a room at work looks like mentor. Paul Green, I'm with the law school as well. Um, and I was, I was wondering, well, first of all, I think it's really great that you um, initiated this uh, director of diversity position, I think it's really awesome. And um, I was just wondering as to, I guess, what went into that decision and what inspired the creation of that position and kind of what that position would entail. So I guess either of you can answer this question. Yeah. You know the well, I guess it's entailing the position, but you can yeah. say what I do great for. So my messages on diversity and inclusion are really simple. We should want more women, more people of color, not because we're doing something nice for someone else, but because it's better for our bottom line. We know that when we take full talents of the population, companies <coughs> outperform, institutions outperform. So this is a critical business issue for Facebook and my entire industry. We need more women, we need more people with all kinds of backgrounds because we are serving 1.2 billion people around the world. And how do we serve those people if our company doesn't, doesn't represent that? Uh, the way we've hired the mostly has been posting jobs and people finding us and when women don't find us as much and people of color don't find us as much so we're now coming to you. <laughs> <laughs> Basically it's what's happened and so. Hi, I'm Ayo Bakari, president of the um, MBA program. So you talked about getting a seat at the table. So for young executive, for young aspiring executives like us with no experience, how do you advise us to get a seat at that table to be noticed? So the first thing I would say is that the most important thing coming out of school is actually picking what table. Picking, picking your picking your industry, picking your table that you want to do something you really love and care about, and you hopefully want to do something that's expanding, right? The best career decision you can make is actually go to a go to a field that's expanding. Because no matter how good you are, when fields and companies are shrinking, they're shrinking. And there's fewer opportunities and a lot of qualified people to do it. And when fields and companies are expanding, they're expanding. Uh, probably the best decision I made coming out of government was go to technology. And it sounds obvious now, but I did it in 2001 when there were no jobs. And there's a huge recession in the tech bubble at first. You're all way too young for this, but trust me. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was bleak, and people thought it was crazy. But I really believed tech could grow. Now, it doesn't have to be tech. It can be something you love. But I tell people, really pick an industry you love, start there, and then pick the growing part. There's a growing part for every industry. You know, there's a place where your skills. The next thing I would say is, really, when you're first coming out, as much as you want to focus on the table, focus on building the skills that get you to the table. You're probably not going to run a business your first year out, unless you're Mark Zuckerberg and you drop out and start it. But <laughs> I wasn't that talented. But there are skills you can get which will get you to that table, and I would really focus on building those skills. Um, another thing I talk about is take jobs, especially for people where there are biases against us, minorities, women. Take jobs where things are measurable. Take sales jobs. Sales jobs are great. Not enough people take them, especially coming out of top business schools like Howard and all of these. Sales jobs are awesome because your success can be totally measured, and life is really a lot about selling things. It really is. It's kind of counterintuitive. I don't think people talk enough about in business school, or maybe they do here. I haven't met a lot of business school students who are trying to get sales jobs. I think sales jobs are really great entry to the world. A man and a woman alone in a room looks like. 64% of managers in the United States say they're afraid to be alone in the room. We only mentor alone in the room with people. And so if we don't start systematically being honest about the fact that every time a man and a woman are alone together, it doesn't mean something wrong is happening, we can't get them in the mentorship. So Lean In works with students to form Lean In circles. I don't want you to wait around for someone to mentor you. I want you to mentor each other because you can do that. 
and we work with companies and institutions to encourage them to get to the mentorship you need. So I hope you join us. It's really important to think about gathering as much data as you can those first few years out, kind of as you're always saying about picking your table. And it's hard to know until you experience it. And so you go into a position or an opportunity thinking, okay, these are the things I like, these are the areas that I want to focus on, and you experience it and you gather more data. And if that's the right place, then you can grow and expand, and if not, then you have that experience and you can move to the next um, opportunity, which is advisable, and just continue to gather more information to find what's really going to make you happy. I mean, I graduated from college, from a business school in, in uh, Texas, and went to Wall Street, I was an analyst, that was what I wanted to do, 100%, I had set my whole college career for that, and within a month I realized it was not the place for me. But I stuck it out, and it was really valuable when I was in business school, when all of our classmates were trying to get jobs in Wall Street. I already had that experience, and I knew that wasn't for me, and so I was able to focus in another area, and it was helpful because I didn't waste time being attracted to something that everybody else was because I already had that information. So you just have to, don't be disappointed if you don't like it, just know this is really good information. And you have four or five years after graduation to just experiment, if that's what I would say. My name is Brandon Mullins, I'm also a student from the law school. And we mentioned how there are fewer employment opportunities, not just for law students, but just in general. And I was wondering from your perspective, what do you think are some key qualities to focus on and develop when we're noticing some certain paradigm shifts and hiring criteria and priorities? I look for people who are going to solve problems, not raise them. Raising them is great, and we want people to be honest, but people who have a track record of solving problems. Um, we look for leadership, and you've shown it. Um, you're one of the leaders of, yes, <laughs> you've shown that, which is great, but I think leaning in circles are really great leaning opportunity for you great leadership opportunity. Anything you want, where you've where you led. Um, I also look hard for people who want to get their hands dirty particularly coming out of business school. It's not just people who want to manage other people, it's people who want to do real work. I have a poster in my office that has two really dirty hands, and the person in it says the future belongs to the best willing to get our hands dirty. So, you know, I'm the CEO of Facebook, but I do recruiting on my own. I handle sales, I do still do sales calls, and I still do deals. We really care about people who are willing to get in there and do real work. We never want to hire people, we just want to manage other people doing stuff. Because, you know, we want generals who are there with their trainers. Because if you're going to be a great manager and leader, you need to do the work along with. And I think showing that you are willing to do anything. We talk about Facebook as playing low and playing high. I mean, you know, I'm the COO. I come here, I give big speeches, but you know what? Mark's my boss, and sometimes I have to bring Gatorade for him. Because if he doesn't have Gatorade, his like, blood sugar goes down because it goes well. And so I literally walk around my first with Gatorade. If I'm whatever it takes to get the meeting to go well, whatever it takes to get the job done, I'm willing to do. And I think people are willing to play low and play high. Maybe Many times in um, African Americans who are in corporate America, we are told that you have to be 100% better than, or 150% better than. And one of the things that I love in your book was get it done, don't be perfect, or something. Mm -hmm. oh, um, that it's uh, done is better than perfect. That's mm -hmm. it. I love that. Done is better than perfect. But when you know we're in, especially for folks coming into the corporate world, and they're seeing the expectations of them to be super perfect. But it doesn't give them the uh, ability to fail or feel that they can fail. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Um, what it entails is actually understanding the way the business works and then figuring out how diversity can be, as I said, an asset to that. Um, so obviously, the biggest asset is our people. And we want the people to be the brightest ones um, who understand the business and be able to reflect what the people use the product want. So my job is to understand the company really well and then to build the strategies that we need to do three things like that. One is to communicate well around diversity. So what is the message? How do people understand diversity? Because the way you understand it will influence the way you approach it. We want everyone at Facebook to be a champion of diversity, an ambassador, right? Um, so we want to be sure that we, we have the message right, people understand it. Because too often people think in the business world when you talk about diversity, you're talking about uh, lowering standards. Like 
female just because of their gender, just because of their race, right? As opposed to seeing that as an asset. So we want to get into that message. And then we want to actually um, recruit more, find more of these people because we think it adds to the value overall. And then ultimately, and this is a big piece of it, we want to make sure we can cultivate that talent. So it's not enough to get them in the door. If we don't have an environment that will hold them and that will build them, because we want more leaders, right? Uh, so it's a sort of a, I, I think there are three main buckets, and we want to try to work on those strategically and systematically so we can build them on the scale. Because Facebook is actually a big business. I think a lot of students, you use it a lot, but people often say, you know, people working on Facebook. <laughs> you kind of think that you post something, it just kind of goes up, right? <laughs> maybe there are four people in a room, or maybe you saw the movie about Mark Zuckerberg, and there are like 20 guys in a row. But it's not like that anymore. Actually, to get something posted and seen by all of those people really quickly to work that whole news feed, it takes a lot. Um, so we need a lot of different minds working on it. We want to make sure it's the type of place people and want to Part of my it. biggest advice along with getting your hands dirty is done is better than perfect. Yes. So most organizations, most law firms, most businesses, most companies, most institutions, they don't fail by doing too much, they fail by doing too little. Right? Go, go think about how do companies fail? How do institutions fail? They almost never fail by doing too much. Those stories are few and far between. They fail by moving too slow, mm -hmm. by doing too little. And so, I don't do anything perfectly. Charlton, the one person who works directly with me at Facebook, will tell you, boy, we got some big gaps in my life. <laughs> he helps close them and find them. But I don't do anything perfectly, but if I did anything perfectly, I would do nothing because I would be like, oh my God, this has to be perfect. So, you know, literally people who move fast and are willing to do things and turn them in, that's what we're looking for and most of our institutions do too little. We are worried if Facebook fails, we are not going to fail by doing too much. We are going to fail by getting out innovated by three, probably men who are in the garage. That's how we're going to fail. And you look at the history and I think really understanding that and you don't have to be perfect, you have to keep getting up to that. So important. I would, I would just add to that. Um, I think that you also have to be mindful of the stereotypes that people will project on you. Um, that's the reality. And so I would say that it's very important in the beginning of your career when you start a position, when you're new to an organization, it's, it's helpful to be as perfect as you can. And then you have established the credibility so that you can be more creative. You can move more quickly. You know, you can take have more leeway to come up with better ideas that may not always succeed. But I do feel, but but you're still moving forward and things, you know, it doesn't have to, like you said, risk is um, applauded and, and supported. Other people may come up with ideas about different things and that's great. You come up with those ideas, but you have to, from day one, Make sure that you are setting an incredible perception of yourself. <laughs> I'm Ben Litchfield. I'm also at the law school. Um, over the past real uh, 12, 15 years, we've seen social media explode from you know a couple college kids friending each other to a real commercial space and a market segment. Um, my question for you is this: As social media becomes mainstream and becomes a real economic powerhouse, what role do you see? social media playing in power and formerly or currently underrepresented groups? Oh, it's huge. That's why I do this job. And I'll talk about it on the stage today. You know, you think about the world before social media. In order to have distribution, to have your voice heard, you need to be rich, famous, on a TV station. Facebook gives every single person for free voice, right? Everyone can publish to the world. Now, some things catch on and some don't, but the fact that we give voice to people who are historically not in power is huge. And you see that across large swaths of population. I mean, I remember when Barack Obama was running, he was very derisively called the Facebook candidate. Anyone remember that? He was the Facebook candidate, and that was not a compliment at the time. We were cheering. We were like, yes, he is, and he's going to win. <laughs> because he is using his voice in a really authentic way. You look at it at SMB, it's small businesses. Small businesses drive our economy. Small businesses employ more women, small businesses employ employ more people of color. How do you start and market a business? If before you had to buy TV ads, now you can go into Facebook and buy ads for five bucks. And so 
these tools, which are given to everyone for free, which are replacing very expensive distribution methods, are so important for voice and why I do this. <laughs> um, my last question for you today is, if you could be doing anything other than running this mammoth of a company, what would you be doing? Well, I'd be doing what I am doing, which is fighting for equality for women and for everyone. You know, I, I, I really love Facebook because I love how we give voice to everyone. Rich poor, whether you're born literally in the hills of Africa and you get a cell phone, or you're born, you know, into New York City, we get voice. And I really believe that we need diversity in our leadership ranks. Really, and it's not happening. The numbers are not moving up for women. They are not moving up for people of color fast enough. And so, the ability to work on Facebook and the ability to work on LinkedIn with amazing women. Mixing makes a huge difference. And I feel like I'm doing exactly what I want to be doing. And the thing I'll say is, I didn't always. Not every job is perfect. Not every part of being at Facebook or even every part of LinkedIn is perfect. I take the good with the bad, the bad with the good. But over the years, I've worked my way into stuff that I just really, really, really believe. Um, and you have to go into the workforce believing you will too because you will. I mean, you're getting the best education at one of the country's leading schools. You can do anything you set your mind to it. Sometimes you have to start more junior, like I did in tech. But it's worth it. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. And to really expand that uh, uh, reservoir of opportunities that will accrue to our students. And that's why next year.